complex life has endured on this earth for the last half a billion years. Throughout its epic journey, it has evolved into many different forms, creating a world full of biodiversity. However, five times during Earth's history, there have been major drops in this biodiversity. These are the five mass extinction events, each of which have wiped out at least 70% of all life on Earth. Despite these many devastating events, however, life has always managed to pull through. But there was one time when it almost didn't. Around 252 million years ago, at the end of the Permian period, life came the closest it has ever been to disappearing completely. In just a span of a million years, 300 million years of evolutionary progress was almost completely snuffed out. Out of the five mass extinction events, this is the only one which has truly been dubbed the Great Dying. Welcome back everyone to The Great Dyings, a video series where we explore the five mass extinctions and the devastating effects they had on life on our planet. Today, as I've already established, we will be exploring the most deadly of these events, the Permian-Triassic mass extinction event, which occurred on the Permian-Triassic border. The Permian period was an incredibly bizarre time during Earth's history, so before we delve into The Great Dying, we must first briefly go over the Permian globe. The Permian period is the sixth and last period of the Paleozoic era. It lasted for around 47 million years, from 299 to 252 million years ago. It was preceded by the Carboniferous period and followed by the Triassic, the first period of the Mesozoic era. The Permian period is a very unique period in terms of animal life, geography, and climate. Marine life during the Permian has left behind a shockingly low yield of fossils compared to the other periods of geological history. However, this doesn't mean that the Permian seas were barren. It simply means that the conditions at the time didn't exactly agree with the fossilization process. This is known as preservation bias, where geological and climatic conditions prevent fossilization from taking place. I have an entire video about it on my channel that you can go check out if you want to learn more. Anyways. What we are able to tell is that the oceans of the Permian period were inhabited by many familiar creatures, such as graptolites, ganeotites, and other kinds of ammonites, and, of course, trilobites. Fish such as xenacanthus and acanthodes swam the seas as well. The apex predators at the time were sharks, like the ones that had been ruling the oceans since the late Devonian mass extinctions wiped out the placoderms. Probably the most well-known of these sharks is the helicoprion, famous for the bizarre whirl of teeth that it likely used for feeding on soft-bodied prey. Other than that, though, there aren't really any major things we know about the Permian Seas. So, let's look at life on land, where things really start to get interesting. By the Permian period, life had finally conquered the terrestrial world. With the vast expanse of land to explore, many interesting creatures appeared during this time. Plant life, especially seeded plants, continued to diversify and spread across the globe. However, animal life is really where we can find interesting life forms. During the Permian, two major groups of animals evolved, the synapsids and the diapsids. These two groups differ by the amount of fenestras or openings in their skull. Synapsids have one, while diapsids have two. These two different groups, while not very different at the time, would each go on to diversify and create two of the most significant lineages in the history of life. The first diapsids would go on to become the ancestors of almost all reptiles, including the dinosaurs. Meanwhile, the synapsids, while they were very reptilian at the time, would go on to become the ancestors of all mammals, including all of you watching this video right now. One of the most well-known synapsids of this time was the dimetrodon, the 3.5 meter or 11.5 foot long stem mammal, which is often mistaken for a dinosaur. By the end of the Permian, many synapsids would evolve into therapsids, a group of synapsids from which all mammals descend from. Among the therapsids were many bizarre groups of animals, such as the dinocephalians. Name meaning terrible head, this group of therapsids are known for their bizarre head shapes. One of the most well-known animals from this group a Steminosuchus shows pretty much a perfect example of the head shapes these creatures possessed. Another significant group of therapsids from the Permian were the Gorgonopsids. 
They were the apex predators of the late Permian, and one of the most ferocious predators in the history of life. They were around 3 meters or 10 feet long, and had large jaws fit with fangs. Most notably, there is some evidence to suggest that Gorgonopsids had small hairs, which would have been a first for Therapsids. The herbivorous Dicynodonts, such as Lystrosaurus, were another group of Therapsids which made their living through living in burrows and feeding on plants and roots. Finally, there were the Cynodonts. Cynodonts were small and resourceful Therapsids, with the appearance of a rodent. They lived in burrows and were mostly carnivorous. By the early Permian, all of the major land masses on Earth were joined together into the well-known supercontinent of Pangaea. In terms of the ocean, the long-lived Pantalassic Ocean dominated the rest of the Earth. For much of the early Permian, parts of Pangaea were covered in glacial ice sheets. However, during this period, these glaciers would disappear as the temperatures around the equator skyrocketed to 74 degrees Celsius, or 165 Fahrenheit. The formation of Pangaea made conditions extremely difficult for life on land. As if the climate wasn't already scorching enough, the landmass prevented rainwater from reaching the center of the continent. Despite these violent conditions, however, life would find a way, but it would only just barely bounce back from what would happen next. The Permian-Triassic mass extinction began approximately 252 million years ago, at the end of the Permian period, and proceeded into the Triassic period. It took place over about a million years, which, compared to most other mass extinctions, is incredibly brief. Like many extinctions, we aren't 100% sure what caused the Permian extinction. Some theories suggest the possibility of an asteroid collision or a rise in methane-producing bacteria, which would have made the atmosphere and oceans toxic were to blame. Despite the uncertainties, however, there is one theory which has a lot of evidence to back it up, which is considered to be the most likely cause of the Great Dying. In Russia is a shockingly large 7 million square kilometer, or 3 million square mile, expanse of land covered in igneous rock, known as the Siberian Traps. Igneous rock results from cooled lava, which means, somehow, this 7 million square kilometer expanse of land was at one time blanketed in lava. Such a thing may have been possible during the Permian period, thanks to the newly formed supercontinent of Pangaea. Because of the tectonic collisions taking place, a large pocket of magma may have formed under the supercontinent, causing large-scale volcanism in what is now western Siberia. This would have resulted in a lava plume that could have lasted for over a million years, masking over 7 million square kilometers in molten lava. However, it wasn't the lava which disrupted the entire globe. These continuous violent eruptions would have released tons of toxic gases, such as carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and hydrogen sulfide, which may have made the atmosphere toxic. Terrestrial plants would have been hit hard by these toxic atmospheres, and thus many terrestrial animals, which relied on these plants, would die out. As well as affecting the atmosphere, these gases would have caused a greenhouse climate, not unlike the one we are already heading towards today. This would have led to an intense global warming, which would have worsened the already arid conditions on land. The extinction of many plants would also have made these climate conditions worse, since there was not as many plants to draw in carbon dioxide and stabilize the atmosphere. This global warming would have had a major impact on the seas as well. The rising temperatures would have been too warm for many marine organisms, and would have also starved the seas of oxygen, causing a global marine anoxic event. The oceans would become even more unbreathable, as much of the carbon dioxide went unabsorbed. High levels of CO2 in the ocean would have caused the pH levels or toxicity levels to rise. Tectonic collisions of Pangaea may have also caused the destruction of many marine habitats and disrupted oceanic currents. As conditions continue to get worse and worse, the planet would slowly become more and more uninhabitable. While not hit nearly as hard as life in the oceans, Life on land was still hit really hard by the extinction. Many of the bizarre and unique species of synapsids were wiped out, including the Gorgonopsids and the Dinosaphalians. Insects were hit exceptionally hard as well, 
In fact, the Permian-Triassic extinction took the heaviest toll on insect biodiversity out of all the five mass extinctions. This extinction killed off 83% of insect genera in just a million years. But the true carnage was in the oceans. Since ocean life relies heavily on a stable oxygen condition, the aquatic anoxia took a heavy toll. The extinction killed over 95% of all ammonites, brachiopods, and gastropods. The unique apex predators such as Helicoprion would also meet their extinction. Rising pH levels in the ocean would also cause the bleaching and extinction of many species of coral and the fish that relied on them. Most devastatingly, though, 100% of all goniotites, blastoids, and canthodes, and eurypterid sea scorpions would die out. And after 290 million years, the reign of the trilobite ended, as 100% of all trilobites went extinct. Overall, 70-80% to 80 of all terrestrial life and a staggering 96% of all marine life were wiped off the face of the earth for good, giving a total average of around 90%. When the dust settled, much of the planet appeared to be barren and lifeless, not unlike how it appeared billions of years ago during the Precambrian. The Permian extinction was so devastating that scientists considered it to be the end of the Paleozoic era and the beginning of the Mesozoic. It would take life almost 30 million years to recover. This was the closest life on Earth ever came to dying, and probably the closest it ever will until the day it does go extinct. The Permian-Triassic mass extinction resulted in one of the most bizarre periods in Earth's history, the Triassic. A few synapsids would survive to see this period, including the Dicynodont Lystrosaurus. In fact, not only would Lystrosaurus live to see the light at the end of the tunnel, but it would flourish in the barren landscape of the early Triassic. With all their predators and competition wiped off the face of the earth, and plenty of roots in the ground for food, there was nothing stopping these beaver-sized goofballs from dominating the planet. Lystrosaurus numbers skyrocketed during the first few million years of the Triassic to the point that they made up almost 75 to 95 percent of all land living animals. However, an old rival would see them to their extinction. The diapsids were back, and with some of the only synapsids left being defenseless four-legged meatballs, they were ready to exact revenge for all the years of living in the synapsid's shadows. Monsters such as Erythrosuchus were some of the first archosaurs a group of diapsids, which would later include the non-avian dinosaurs. These archosaurs would thrive on the plentiful and defenseless Lystrosaurus. Eventually, the Lystrosaurus, the short-lived rulers of the world, would no longer waddle through the Triassic landscape. However, synapsids wouldn't go completely extinct. Resourceful cynodonts would survive the extinction and the predatory archosaurs, and would go on to evolve into the first mammals many a millions of years later. It is thanks to these adaptable underdogs that you sit here watching this video today. The effects of the Permian-Triassic mass extinction will be felt well into the Triassic, but not as decreases in biodiversity, but rather as increases. With a good 90% of all life on Earth extinct, the ones who remained were left many environmental niches to fill. During the Triassic period, evolution would run wild, creating some of the most bizarre prehistoric animals in the fossil record, such as Adipodentatus or Tanytrophius, and it is believed that this swell in evolution led to the most iconic prehistoric beasts of them all, the dinosaurs. So, now you know how the Permian-Triassic mass extinction coined the name The Great Dying, due to its unrivaled effects on biodiversity. Now you know the story of how life almost died. Next time on The Great Dyings, we will explore the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction. While the Permian extinction gave way to the evolution of dinosaurs, it was the Triassic extinction that allowed dinosaurs to take over the world. But until then, thanks for watching. Please keep in mind that this is an informal source of information. All the sources used are considered reliable. This source should not be used for professional or educational purposes 
except if the information presented can be confirmed by other sources or an expert slash educator.